the true theater, because it moves and makes use of living instruments, continues to stir up shadows where life has never ceased to crop its way. To break through language in order to touch life is to create or recreate the theater. The essential thing is not to believe that this act must remain sacred, meaning set apart. This leads to the rejection of the usual limitations of men and men's power and infinitely extends the frontiers of what is called reality. Expressed by Antonin Artaud, these words have since 1998 been given life in the spellbinding creations of Blue Mouth Inc. Performance Collective, challenging the levels of interaction between performers and audience Blue Mouth Inc. creates site-specific performances by kneading together choreographed movement, text, visual media, immersive sound design, original live music, video, and film to create experiences in alternative spaces. Every creation of the collective is an immersion into a new world, each with its specific atmosphere, color, sound, sense, notes, and forms, where the artist is a thousand characters in one. As a deep and pure immersion into life, with its surprises and challenges, the creations of Blue Mouth Inc. awaken the senses and extend them beyond the frontiers of our realities, questioning our era in its time and its space, its human and its natural boundaries. With one foot on either side of the border, the award-winning company and its founding members have their roots in New York City, Toronto and Montreal. Their new piece, Elephant, is available on their website at bluemouthinc.life. That's bluemouthinc.life. I have the pleasure of welcoming Lucy Simich and Stephen O'Connell for an in-focus conversation for Smart Magazine. Hello, Lucy and Steven. Hello. Hello. <laughs> How are you? So happy to be here. Yeah. Good to have you. Good having you. Uh, how are you guys and how are things in New York City? Look nice. Yeah, things are, I mean, the weather today is beautiful in the, uh, the park. We live in Brooklyn uh, and um, uh, the park was packed with people. It was actually really interesting. So aside, I was walking through the park and there's someone walking around shaking hands with people. And I'm like, who's everyone staring at? And it was uh, Andrew Yang, who uh, ran for president uh, recently. He's running for mayor of New York. Uh, and so today he was walking around our neighborhood, uh, shaking hands with people and uh, introducing himself. I was like, oh, that's pretty interesting. Wow. <laughs> so things are very active in New York. Yeah. <laughs> well, good thing. <laughs> Okay, guys, so my first question would be, how would you describe Blue Mouth Inc.'s mission? Okay, um, it has evolved over time, but the mission ha has, uh, the root of it has maintained uh, this um, interdisciplinary kind of democratic uh, uh, collective, or we used to say collective, and now we kind of go between collective and highly collaborative. Uh, so there is still no hierarchy. There's, there's no um, other than in the administration, like, but creatively when we're in a room together, everyone has an equal opportunity to present ideas and, and develop their ideas and give feedback on each other's um, uh, ideas to, you know, we're all serving the same purpose of making the piece um, realizing the piece in, in the best way possible. Um, and it's also interdisciplinary. A lot of the time we use uh, site specific or, or alternative locations. Um, and one of the missions is to kind of constantly look at how um, the performer and audience relationship can be um, challenged increased uh, uh that that boundary like involving the audience we used to have we used to our earlier pieces were more like performance installations a little bit like sleep no more if if you've seen that like where the audience is walking around the space and the performers and we've sort of slowly over time wanted to increase that 
actual uh, give audience agency. So, uh, so for example, in dance marathon, the audience became contestants in a dance marathon, and they were dancing and they were um, uh, going through these different um, uh, games or or challenges and being eliminated or moving up to the next level or. Um, and, uh, and so they, they seem to be a little bit, a lot of people described their experience of dance marathon as being the, um, the center of their own story. So it was really, uh, an individual. Yeah. Yeah. And it's changed a lot over, I mean, the company has been together for over 23 years, uh, which in itself is a, a bit of a, um, uh, amazing feat, uh, for any group or, or collective. Um, but when we started working together, the term that was often used is um, site specific, uh, and that language around that has um, evolved over the last you know twenty years. And uh, and there's also not that it's new. I think even when we started doing, there was already people like, you know, there was a very uh, famous piece um, uh, in Toronto um, that was done by Richard Rose, which was um, uh, site specific. Tomorrow. Tomorrow. Uh, and there's like a long history in Toronto and other in places like New York of doing sort of immersive work. Um, but more recently now the language has shifted from site specific to immersive performance. And so shows like Sleep No More or De La Guarda, for, you know, from Argentina, uh, these shows where the audience is sort of um, uh, immersed in, in, in an experience. And uh, I don't know, I was just this morning because I, I was updating um, our website um, on uh, and sort of had to put in a line to describe what we do. Um, and the way we talk about it recently or more recently is that, you know, creating sort of um, uh, unique experiences for adventurous audiences in um, alternative spaces. Uh, it's a little bit long, but it kind of encapsulates it's it's not for everybody. It's, you know, if you're interested in sitting in a seat and seeing a show um, theater, which is beautiful and wonderful. I go see lots of shows and at the Brooklyn Academy of Music, which is right next to where we live. Um, but if you if you really want an immersive, unique experience, like um, rowing a boat out to Toronto Island, um, that's not for everybody. Um, and uh, so it's for um, adventurous audiences for sure. Um, and it takes place in um, in you know in alternative spaces, and that can be anything or any has been anywhere from like a porno theater to a um, an um, an old warehouse to a barber shop to. Um, an empty funeral, funeral parlor or, or, or even a, a traditional theater space with all the seats taken out. Um, so it's really uh, changed over the years and uh, um, and because there were a collective and the, the size and the, the number of people who we collaborate with um, changes as well and that sort of informs the, the style and the direction of the work. <clears throat> yeah, and actually, so your creations you are inviting the audience <laughs> into whole world that you have conceived. And then during the performance, you're constantly pushing back those boundaries of the worlds until the horizons nearly disappear and the unexpected emerges. <laughs> Is your work a call out to freedom, a dare or a challenge to go behind appearances, to seek out and name the unnamed? I think it's a little bit of all of those and mm -hmm. and depending on which piece uh, I mean even some pieces contain uh, the, the contradictions of those things as well so I, I feel like the free, the word freedom I think uh, is accurate in that we're trying to break the uh, uh, conventions of, of performance practices or, or try and push those boundaries so we're free to um, reinvent or or invent our own combination of like sometimes people come and say oh you guys need a director or oh you guys need a writer or you know and and <laughs> i think it's sort of uh we're like maybe if we were doing something that was a little bit more conventional we would be working you know with a choreographer or a director or a you know but but because we're making things from scratch and we're writing and directing each other and choreographing and um, we have the freedom to kind of blur those lines that maybe uh, a pure choreographic piece or a pure theater piece or a, you know, is so uh, it, it wouldn't, we would be breaking those rules in, in some ways, like the well-made play or, 
you know. Um, yeah, and I think it's, it's also a, like a genuine curiosity uh, in um, exploring the relationship between the, the spectator and the performer. Uh, and, uh, you know, in, I, in like creating sort of uh, poor situations where we can sort of weave things together. And so like with the, It Comes in Waves, which is the show on Toronto Island, uh, there's a moment where, you know, the audience is invited to play a game of poker. Um, and uh, the you know when they uh, the losers of the game have to draw a card, um, and depending on what suit they draw from the the deck of cards, they either have to tell a story, tell a joke, uh, sing a song, or remove an article of clothing, mm -hmm. uh, which is meant to be funny, but it's also um, and it is, um, <clears throat> but it's also really um, moving when you're you create something. The piece was a sort of a meditation on on grief and and loss and. <clears throat> um, but suddenly, you know, you you are given an audience member an opportunity to to tell a personal story, and it sort of it takes the work to another level. That's really interesting. But that's just to know that's also a curated experience. We do a lot of prototyping. So, for example, in a poker game, if you hear seven stories, it's less effective than if you hear a song, two jokes, and one story. And so, over through you know, prototyping and through experimentation, we work a lot with the iteratively working with audience members coming in and we do several variations until we do the final presentation. And even then it's constantly growing and changing. But then we, we sort of tweak it and, and, and figure out, we don't control what people say, but we realize that there's the way of framing something um, can be more or less effective uh, within, the, within the context of the work that we're creating. And it's really powerful. I, I mean, we did the show in Edinburgh and, um, you know, someone picked out a song <clears throat> uh, and I, I, the song, it was incredible. The entire place was singing. It was so, it's so incredibly moving. <clears throat> and then uh, somebody else told a really touching story about their mother or, and just that, that kind of, you couldn't script that. If you did, it would feel really false. Mm -hmm. And so the idea that we, um, what we do is we, we score opportunities for things to occur. Uh, and most time it does occur. Like you don't even have to make it happen. It just happens naturally, which is. But I think it's also that we've cultivated this, you know, like because we ourselves, like I think it kind of speaks to the idea of daring or challenging mm -hmm. um, uh, to, to go to places and say and, and uh, uh, unveil things that most people don't talk about. So this idea of intimacy has always been with us. Like we we mm -hmm. feel like we are not really playing characters. We're kind of heightened versions of ourselves. Like, so it's usually personal things, usually truthful things. Um, and we're very intimate, like in the close proximity, physical proximity to the audience uh, creates that intimacy and allows them to kind of feel like they're, they're able to also share in that intimacy. And, and a lot of them dare to, 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 you know, to cross that line and, yeah. and offer their own which, creative voices. Which is also challenging to some of our collaborators. We had an amazing performer named Danny Wild coming to work with us on the Island Project. Uh, and, you know, there's a moment in the beginning where we invite the audience to set up for a party because someone's coming, a guest is coming, and, and we get the audience to sort of hang streamers and it's not right and we get them to change it. Uh, and Danny was always really confused. He's like, what if I run into someone I know? Am I Danny or am I the character? And I'm like, well, you're both. And it, he had a really difficult time. Like, do I talk to them as I know them? I'm like, sure. He's like, but then I go into a monologue. How do I negotiate that that terrain? And so, uh, and for us, it's become quite natural to do that to suddenly drop into a monologue or a dance, and then suddenly uh, be present with somebody we know in the space. And uh, so, yeah, it's 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 a bit of a thing that's uh, even now working with our on our more recent project. Again, there's this line between okay, how much of it is autobiographical. Um, and how much of it is, is fictionalized? Do we change someone's names or not change people's names? And so, um, yeah, kind of there's a, a fluidity or a spectrum that we work with that. That's that's uh, that's fun. We we just created for the audience as well. For example, like of the of your wonderful works that I've seen. For example, when it comes in waves, mm -hmm. the audience is coming into a party. So we are all at the party, and then. We, the audience with goosebumps <laughs> are realizing that it's not an actual birthday party, mm. it's something else. And then with Cafe Sarajevo, we, which we're opening this interview, we don't know exactly where we are as an audience. Are we in the streets of Sarajevo? 
uh, are we at this wonderful, like crazy march in America? Like, what are you expecting the audience to have as an experience when they're coming to see your creations? Well, I think like Lucy was saying, it's, a, I mean, uh, not that we're gamers. I don't play, my nephews play lots of video games and they're really, <laughs> even with the show on the island, but also with the uh, Cafe Sarajevo, there's this sort of idea that, you know, we've always talked about the audience being the protagonist. And it, that was like a concept early on with the company. And, and I think from, you know, at times we've realized that more successfully than others. And, and so the audience is kind of, they're their own, they're on their own adventure. And it's okay, like when we did the dance marathon, if somebody goes for a walk and has a drink or walks outside and misses something that's going on, it's perfectly fine. So everyone has a really um, unique and not curated it, but they sort of just, they make decisions. It's very democratic that way about what they want to see. So in many ways, it's like a, like a video game, you know, that like, there isn't a game called Island that we talked about when we were doing the Island show about how, you know, as if your avatar is walking around and having slightly, and you, it crisscrosses with uh, different um, other people's experiences. Uh, and, um, and there are other companies that do it quite interesting. There's company at Sleep No More, I think the audience sort of um, floats through the space. Um, and there's a company here in New York uh, called Third Rail who did a piece based on Alice in Wonderland uh, for a small audience where they curated every single person's experience, which is really interesting. And so you're, you're going on a very individual journey. <clears throat> um, and I think ours falls somewhere in between where the audience can make decisions about what they would like to see and do. Mm -hmm. um, although, um, it's, it's, um, some of them are more open than others. Yeah, some there's, are, you know, yeah. definitely guided like Cafe Sarajevo is yeah. uh, a little bit more guided on a tour, but going back to the, to the idea of things kind of morphing or, or, or flowing into, uh, you know, so you're, it's, you're constantly the idea of the audience being in a, in a place of, um, of uh, instability or 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 destabilizing the audience um, yes. so that anything is possible. Mm -hmm. I think that's something that we 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 uh, aspire to, like even putting them on canoes a little bit and to kind of you know have them canoe to the tr to Toronto Island and then mm -hmm. you know follow Stephen's character. They're going to a party and and uh, he's going to be here soon and all of this. And getting them excited and then and then switching it and and realizing that Stephen it's you know the last moments of his life in a car crash and you know and, and it it just sort of flips everything over and and um and or, or in Cafe Sarajevo you're in a podcast uh you're you know you're participating in a live stream of a podcast and then suddenly the anchors of the podcast who are interviewing my trip to Sarajevo get up and say follow us on this tour to Sarajevo and we we go to these different so this idea of like always surprising the audience and and um and using these I think we've always think, thought of our our earlier pieces were even less um narrative that way um they were more like a, a poem like like a you associative. know associative and <clears throat> this idea of of not not naming something specific um but kind of suggesting things so that there's room for contemplation and i feel like with our interdisciplinary practice our like using dance and music and and video and and uh sound elements as well as text that there's this idea of allowing the audience's own imagination and experience um uh, into the into the room quite largely like a like it's a huge part of it it's yeah and i think one of the, the the techniques that we've learned is to um or tricks uh is that it's really useful to uh, destabilize the audience at the beginning of the show mm -hmm. so as an example we did our first show in new york uh, we did a show that was presented um, in toronto called what the thunder said um, and uh, we found this really big warehouse in lower manhattan we were invited for a festival and what we did is we we built walls and the audience were sort of stuck in this container that was really like a small office space. Mm -hmm. um, and then someone, uh, the, uh, the narrator enters through like a, a air vent and gives a narration. And then suddenly we take the walls away um, and then they're in this huge uh, abandoned warehouse space or uh, empty office space in New York that's massive. Uh, and it's in the like, old AT&T building yeah. down in Tribeca. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it was quite yeah. like beautiful from yeah. the outside. But suddenly the audience is uh, destabilized, but not in a way that sort of like, that makes them frightened or, um, but it makes them in a way like, okay, the rules that I, or the, the uh, concepts or rules, the conceits that I normally play that uh, they bring with me into a theatrical experience are suddenly thrown out the window. And so then there's a, we found then there was an openness to like, okay, the rules have shifted. So now I'm going to relearn what the rules of this particular universe is. And that's yeah. a really useful trick. Yeah. So, and coming back to actually like, I'm talk talking of space and because with your creations, you're giving a whole new poetry to the space. So my question would be, what is the importance of space in the creation and development of your work? And is your choice to work in alternative spaces also a questioning of space in general? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think earlier on, we really, um, we were inspired by works that were immersive um, and, uh, and, you know, that included like Stephen being uh, inspired by the happenings in the 1970s and like reading about that or um, was it? Yeah. yeah, the postmodern dance movement or the happenings like sort of Alan Capro and kind of uh, alternative spaces in places like New York in the 60s and 70s. But I, with us, I would think it, it kind of um, it changes again with a, which each, each piece you know, one of our earlier Toronto works was a um, a five hour show called um, uh, something about a river, uh, which took place along five different locations along the buried Garrison Creek that runs beneath uh, Toronto. <clears throat> and we put up the audience in a school bus um, and we uh, bus them from to five different locations. One, it started in the porno theater on Ballora Street, which is the top of the creek. Uh, and then we took them down to a funeral parlor and half the audience went to um, a shed in the snow um, in uh, Trinity Bellwoods Park. And the other audience, half the audience went to a funeral parlor and then they got on the bus again. And then we took them to the bottom of the base of the creek uh, down at the bottom of Dufferin and Queen Street to an abandoned warehouse. <clears throat> so the, the, that piece was definitely um, impacted by the locations and, the, and the, the sort of topography of the creek that's buried beneath uh, Toronto, both metaphor, metaphorically, but also geographically. Mm -hmm. But then um, the piece we did uh, as a residency at the theater center called um, the Memory of Bombs. We did it in an abandoned warehouse um, down on King Street. A boiler room. A boiler room. That, a, a sort of a, abandoned boiler room. And that, that was like, we walked into that space. Actually, our friend David Duclos, like, you have to look at this space. And we almost, that space inspired us to make something. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was a piece about uh, sectarianism. Again, we were, it was during the, um, uh, the war with, uh, it was going on the Iraq, in the Iraq war. Um, and we were talking about like, um, um, scapegoatism. Yeah, and sort of the politics, the divisive politics that were happening at that time. <clears throat> but the space itself, I mean, it was like, you know, there was a, a boiler room that would sit on brick walls that went 30 feet high. <clears throat> and um, the floor was covered with dirt. Um, and we put bricks, we attached bricks, so we could climb the walls. Um, I played clarinet inside of a, um, like in a shaft that was filled with like dead carcasses. And it was uh, kind of, of pigeons, not people. <laughs> yeah. But it was like this sort of really evocative, uh, like um, almost dangerous space. And for that piece, we asked the audience to sit because the audience walking around, we brought them to the space uh, from the, they had to run Fact through the streets. Yeah, like they were, they were running from a, uh, um, uh, like an air raid uh, and brought them into this, all this space uh, where they'd never been before. Um, but again, that particular space was really uh, inspired us to make work. So it sort of depends on the pieces, and so. Um... But we're we're also really inspired by film, and so I think a lot of the places that we we choose are almost like walking into a onto a film set. <clears throat> so this idea of like um, creating work and adding like using the architecture as yeah. another element, like another discipline, like another in, character in, almost in, yeah. in the in the mix of of the other interdisciplinary. Um, um, you know, uh, palette, it's part of it, the, 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 the locations and some are beautiful and some are gritty and grungy. And, uh, so it, it kind of, it varies and it, and it has an impact on the, on the quality and the senses that people, uh, everything becomes suspect. It's like that, is that part of the piece? Like, you know, it's... <laughs> yes, yes. But so what, what is inspiring? Like what is coming first? Are you getting into a space with a history? 
So like you have the story and you're coming into a space and this is the place where you're going to create your, your work or you are, you, 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 or it's like, it's the, it's the contrary. That's what I'm trying to understand. Oh, it's... What is coming first? The history kind of like, for example, like the creation you did like on Iraq war, mm -hmm. uh, where you like aware that this is the, the kind of space we're looking for or not. I think it goes back and forth. I think it's a little bit of both because like with that particular, with the boiler room, um, it, uh, our collaborator, David Duclos, uh, he brought me to the space and said, I, there's this amazing space. You have to look at it. And he'd seen our shows and he'd, he was working at the theater center at the time. Um, and uh, when I saw the space, it was like, um, and then brought the rest of the group to the space. It was like, we have to make something. And we were already developing and working on a project. We were responding to the, the world that we were living in, the post 9-11 climate that was going on in, uh, in the United States and in Canada. Um, so that, that piece, I think, was a, it's kind of like a conversation. And even with something about a river, we were developing a piece. Uh, and again, it was David Duclos who said, oh, do you know about the Garrison Creek that runs beneath Toronto? And I'm like, and I lied and I said, oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then I researched it. And, um, <laughs> but then it became a really integral part. Like then we went into the history because our usually the, the work develops over its uh, device. So it's all original work that's created over a period of time from anywhere from two to five years. Yeah. Um, so as it, the pieces evolve, the space informs the location. Mm -hmm. um, and it's even a metaphor like that, like the subterranean river is a metaphor for our unconscious um, uh, thoughts. And, and, and uh, so, so there was um, the first uh, uh, section, and we were also working with T.S. Eliot's Wasteland, which also follows the Thames River. Mm -hmm. um, and this kind of post, um, uh, like the lost generation between the two wars. Um, and it, and it are the piece kind of had themes of like uh, ambivalence, this ambivalence of um, political ambivalence, uh, um, uh, spiritual ambivalence. So there was like a section in, uh, in Trinity Bellwoods Park in the snow mm -hmm. that, that we were kind of referencing the Tibetan Book of the Dead. And this kind of being in the wasteland and in, in or not the wasteland, they call it the bardo between mm -hmm. worlds. And so there was like images like that, that, yeah. that so, kind of resonated on a, on a poetic level. Kind of I funny. know you want to say something. No, yeah, it was just a funny story. <laughs> and maybe not an appropriate, but funny story. I was, uh, there was a, uh, a, uh, an event that was going on for years called Performance Creation Canada, which mm -hmm. was um, sort of a, kind of like a, a, a festival, but it was more like a conference or a meeting of, of artists who performed and created their own work. And it was happening in different cities every year across Canada. And they had one in Toronto uh, that was held at the Harborfront Center. And I was invited on a panel for site-specific work. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, someone, uh, and it was quite a lot of people who were there. And on the panel, someone asked me about um, uh, if we'd ever been invited to perform, this is when the company was younger, um, uh, at the High Performance Rodeo in, in Calgary. Uh, and I said, I was like, yeah, we, we, we were performed one time. Uh, we were invited, but I, I kind of felt like we, they weren't taking it seriously as a site specific company. We were kind of filler, you know, just kind of have something interesting to go on. We weren't kind of one of the headlines. And I was like, and so we said, no. And I was like, uh, I said, you know, we're not a bunch of fucking clowns. Mm -hmm. And then somebody in the audience stood up and said, I'm a fucking clown. What do you have against fucking clowns? <laughs> And I was like, oh my God, and everyone got quiet. <laughs> like, what's he going to say? And I'm like, oh my God, I'm so sorry. I'm like, I'm doing exactly to you what's being done to us is I'm not taking your craft seriously. And I want that, like, we make choices to make the work that we make. It's not just because we can't get into a theater or not. It's sort of, uh, it was funny. It's just like, <laughs> like, I don't know. like sorry. <laughs> and so concerning your creations, you... Uh, you are was mostly working uh, collectively. Uh, so is it uh, primarily an artistic choice or a larger wish to create within a community? And do you, uh, do you need times of silence and solitude or is it the more the merrier from the start? Well, just like, so, so um, we're definitely gonna disagree on this because we talked about this before. <laughs> And so, and, and if you were to have the um, the rest of the group here, uh, we'd all disagree. I think so. That's part of the collective process. Um, I I personally feel like the um, 
at the end of the day, whether um, in terms of if the company has or does have any impact on the, you know, the, the ecology of performance in Canada, um, I would think at the end of the day, for me, the, the thing that is probably most um, uh, resonant or interesting about the group is that we've worked collectively uh, it, we, the collective experiment for the last 20 years. I think that there's a, an enormous amount of uh, information, knowledge, and learning from that practice. It's time consuming, uh, it's not efficient, um, but it is totally egalitarian. Uh, it's fo it's, um, it fails many times and it has lots of, uh, there are, and, but the, the, the groping towards some sort of uh, approach of um, collective understanding, you know, uh, to me is really imperative. And, and to me, it's the legacy of the, of the group, if nothing else. I think that that ex to continue even 23 years to maintain that that uh, to explore that experiment and to learn about how to um, how to communicate in that manner and how to share knowledge and work and listen. I'm and I'm still learning 23 years later about how to do that well. Um, so the, to me, I, yeah. You but yeah, <laughs> I mean, I think well, I I think. For me, I think, uh, from my perspective, it's uh, everyone sort of comes in and does a, a, a show and tell. Like, so there's like these ideas that come, you know, we need, I need time away. I, I can't write in the room with other people. Like I, I can sometimes, but I, I need, you know, I kind of like to contemplate what I want to say and, and then bring that into the group and share it. And, you know, maybe they help me edit it or, you know, or, or, they, or someone adds a, turns it into a song like Kira has turned some of my, my writing into songs or Stephen adds a video or you, you know so that that there's this kind of um, uh, collaborate collaborative like adding of, of uh, artistic um, uh, um, styles on it like it might I might be really serious and then someone comes in and turns it into a funny thing or do you know what I mean like that yeah. that happens a lot Mm -hmm. um uh and so i think that uh for me it's a, it's both like you need the group to kind of bring in um and sometimes what happens which i think is is the most valuable thing is that someone does something three weeks ago and brings it in and then suddenly you're th there three weeks later presenting something that you maybe didn't even realize was a seed of that they planted in your head three weeks ago and you're, you know, you run with it somehow and, and uh, or vice versa. I've seen like, you know, ideas that I've sort of brought in that someone has taken. And uh, I think that that, that sort of the, the um, trust and trusting that you're obviously you're in the, in a room of, of artists that, that you want to be in, in a room with, you know, so it's kind of, I mean, that's really important as well. Mm -hmm. Um, I th also think that we've we've matured as uh, as people, but as artists, and and I think also our, the our approach to the, the the method has matured. I mean, like when we first started working together, we were working with a group in in Vancouver, and we would like parse out how many words each person said. It was it was that kind of like even, and it was very conscious. Like we you know, and we even had you know like you didn't direct the last times, so now you try to direct, or you didn't dance, now you dance this time, and we tried to almost impose a certain kind of rotation. And I think now, like even working with the latest project, like we're some of our collaborators who've left the company for taking leave of absence have come back and we're working with, you know, Sabrina, we haven't worked with uh, for a few years. She took a leave of absence and she's now back working with the company. And, and I feel like there's this sense of uh, generosity and trust uh, mm -hmm. that um, as we share material, like she's working on her episode for, for the, her that she's airing next week. Uh, and she sent us copies and she's open to, do you have any suggestions? And I, um, and I feel that that level of trust and, and also the level of generosity and sharing ideas um, is something that it's taken years to get better at, mm -hmm. you know, that I feel like not feeling like you have to have everything in this piece, you know, there'll be next time that I'll be able to do something else or, um, and if I'm giving you feedback, it's not, I'm not giving you feedback from my ego, maybe a little bit, but for the most part, I'm giving you feedback because I, I you know, I feel like it, it'll make the works stronger, resonate more. I'm not trying to 
you know, we're trying to encourage and lift each other's work up to mm -hmm. the level of excellence. And that's, that's taken time and maturity and age. Yeah, I think also it's, um, it's uh, important to remember that most of us um, are creator performers. So we all have like, uh, we, that's how we define ourselves. Mm -hmm. uh, as opposed to, I think maybe some people just want to perform or some people just want to direct or choreograph. And I think we are interested in all of that in, mm -hmm. in, in both. And I, and I think it's a different, um, it's a different career, really, like, yeah, even like with the island show, we collaborated with, um, and this is not meant to be uh, like disparaging to anybody, but we collaborated for us to collaborate with a playwright and a director was a was an experiment because we never worked with a playwright or director. We write and direct our own material, and so we worked with uh, Jennifer Tarver from Necessary Angel and Jordan Tannehill, who's you know won the Governor General Award as a playwright, and they're both amazing. But you know, there'd be a moment when we're rehearsing, and they'd go into a corner and they'd start you know. Um, conferring on the writing or the directing, and we'd be like, whoa, 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 whoa what are you doing? And they're like, what? we're like, no, we're like, we're like over here, like we have to do this together. Uh, and so I think for them it was hard to be like, oh, but Jennifer, Jennifer was actually yeah, quite yeah, open yeah. To, yeah. But it took time to like develop kind of a, a, um, a dialogue or a, a, an approach or a relationship that was um, that we all understood because we had very different ways of working. So. Um, but I do like going back to the thing about the private is I do feel like there's because we work iteratively, there's there's periods where we're not together because we, we tend to work for intense periods of time, like, say, two or three weeks. Mm -hmm. And then we go away. And I think it's for me during that time away is when I daydream, you know, mm -hmm. and that's the time where I'll, I'll read and research and watch films and go see performances. But when we're making work, I can't read, go see or look at anything. Mm -hmm. And because I feel like once I've had time to daydream and, and, you know, and then when we get in the studio, working intuitively, allowing all that research to uh, inform the ideas that we're, we're doing. Yeah. That's the way I sort of view the process. But. <laughs> so, and coming to, uh, coming to, um, to this very uncertain times <laughs> we're going through. So uh, you launched Elephant, which is your new creation during this pandemic, you did it, uh, which is a more individual approach uh, you're proposing. So this series of seven filmed episodes uh, in the form of a diary depicts the artists of the collective in their own worlds of question and reflection. How do you think these uncertain times will affect theater and the performing arts and without a tangible audience, will our solitudes deepen? Mm. Um, I think any, uh, I think that um, people who are able to adapt will, will, you know, will keep moving forward and find different ways of telling their stories or, or their, their expressive um, ideas. Uh, and I think right now the internet is doing that, like we're doing that um, even this interview is like over the internet, you know, and Zoom has become, I probably should have bought sh shares in Zoom like <laughs> two years ago. <laughs> but uh, uh, it's, I think it's uh, always, uh, things are always adapting. Like even after the, the um, housing market crashed in, in the United States, like there were a lot of theater companies that weren't getting funding or, you know, and, and I remember talking to Vallejo Gantner who was, um, uh, the artistic director of PS122 at the time, we were talking to him and he's like, yeah, the ones who are able to adapt are going to survive. And, the, you know, in the, and I think that that's for us, I think part of the reason we've survived this long is because we do adapt. Like we kind of, uh, you know, work with whoever's available, you know, in the early days we were kind of like a band. So it was like, let's make a show and not pay ourselves and then see if anyone wants to produce it. Or do you know what I mean? Like, it was kind of like, you know, Has that changed? Put, we, no, we, we we're better at writing grants now. <laughs> <laughs> we had no time to write grants. We were like just making the work and putting it up and, and uh, you know, now, now we kind of, uh, especially because we live in different cities, it's like impossible to leave, to leave our day job and, and go, you know, somewhere and, and not be paid for a week or two or three. But it's sort of, um, I mean, I, like anything is an opportunity. Um, I mean, not the pandemic. I mean, it was definitely restrictive. 
but I, there there's opportunities to, to learn and to change and to and so i think that yeah. i mean i think with the group there's a genuine curiosity towards tech not just technology that technology can be anything but um like towards discovering and learning new things yeah. whether it's like learning how to new use a new program and project something in a space or whether it's how to use 360 video before we did cafe sarajevo i had no idea what virtual vr and ar and wi-fi and radio frequency and so we it was a you know a two-year learning process learning the questions to ask and then learning how to solve the questions that we were asking mm -hmm. and so but all that's really interesting and even with the with you know um the uh the last year the experiences of the last year and working remotely that i feel i mean i don't think we'll go away from i think we'll continue to explore that i'm not sure how but um you know suddenly it's interesting where our work before was perhaps limited to a certain geographical area just because of physical space like where we're doing a performance but now we can put a film on you know uh, on our website um, and say it's going to start at this time and there's people from australia there's people you know from germany from ireland from croatia from new york from vancouver all looking um, and watching our work and so suddenly you know you're you, it opens up the opportunity to share what you're doing um, immediately with um, with a larger uh, community of people. Um, mm -hmm. But I mean, there's also, I mean, clearly there's a desire to be, to share physical space. Yeah. I mean, I, I think that we all, you know, we did do, a, we tried to do a rehearsal period in Montreal last uh, fall. Um, and Lucy and I drove up there from New York and we went into quarantine for 14 days. We were ready to start. Uh, and then on the last day of our quarantine, one of our uh, colleagues' husband got diagnosed, got um, tested, uh, tested positive. positive for COVID, uh, and suddenly uh, we, everyone had to leave. Lucy and I had to go back to the United States to get uh, tested. Um, uh, luckily, everyone was okay. Uh, they he had a very mild case, and um, and none of us else. We ended up getting tested negative. So, um, but it kind of kind of like took the wind out of our sail a little yeah. bit like we were on this momentum we're going to get together we're going to be in studio we're going to start to create scenes and figure out the order and um and it's sort of like kind of we all kind of left a little bit like disappointed and you know and i think that's when the idea to create the episodes happened to kind of because we still wanted to to create we still wanted to create together and um, and share in each other's um, uh, visions and and um, uh, and we do like we have like two three dress rehearsals like be before each episode and we show each other the videos and get feedback from each other so it's not a hundred percent like individual um, it's uh, I think people it's still collaborative um, even through the distance but even working um, towards uh getting together in july physically yeah so i think there's a real i think that that's really integral even though i, I we hope to simulcast the live performance but we i think we want to physically if possible share space with people because i think with audience yeah. mm -hmm. with each other and with the audience um at a, at this kind of dinner party um and yeah and so far with Elephant, like how has been the interaction with the audience? So now with not a live audience, who is a, like a, from the screen audience. So how did it go? Really well, Going. like really well. Like we were all guessing, oh, maybe 30 people will show up, maybe. <laughs> <You know? laughs> I think Lisa said like, uh, let's say 12. <laughs> <laughs> she was playing it on the safe side so uh yeah, but and we've had like people on the day of like a lot of people like uh, i think 60 to 70 people actually at that time and then over the internet like i think my episode has been viewed like 400 times like from in different time zones you know because i think like for example my family uh, my mom and my brother and his family live in croatia so it would have been three in the morning when my episode was screened. So, you know, there's like those, um, and then people who we haven't heard from a long time, you know, like, uh, we toured Australia with dance marathon in the early 2010s, like, uh, and we saw that there were people who had seen it on, in Australia that were still following. And, you know, so it's, it's been really, um, 
kind of amazing like to to see that and to mm-hmm. and and to also to get such beautiful feedback you know like people were really um really um, like a, one of our friends um said something about because uh during Mar- with the first feedback Mar- mariel was saying oh we wanted to do like um uh interactive for um, minecraft minecraft <laughs> and all these people were like yay for minecraft and they were like and then uh, one of our friends was like you know what you're doing is so from our it's maybe it's uh not minecraft but it's like you know the G- generation x which is our generation and it's so touching and so it speaks to to our our gener because we were talking about having different generations in the creative practice like mariel's in her early 30s lisa's 40 most of us are in our 50s so it's um that affects the work as well and i think that steven's always been like wanting to bring in younger audience or younger uh, collaborators collaborators, um to kind of uh because they're gonna have a different perspective and and different skills that that you know um, i think it's also um unintentionally or slightly maybe intentionally has kept the company um uh, going is that sort of I think bringing in new artists like working and collaborating with new people because the projects change depending on who's collaborating and that changes all the time um, and even though there's some consistency there because we refer to like blue mouth moments so there is some certain aesthetic of what we do that is fairly that recognizable um, but I think bringing in new people and also even whether it's not it just have to be young people but it's having new ideas because a good idea can come from anywhere and i think being open to and serving a good the best idea in the room and so i think having different perspectives is refreshing for the company and and that was taken from my there's a company that i interned when we first moved to new york uh, there's a company here called the wooster group who you know was a collective a collaborative uh, company does experimental theater for the last probably 50 years i guess maybe more um and i've interned with them um, as a seasoned artist. I was I, I volunteered just because I wanted to watch their creative process and like, why is their work so interesting and relevant, you know, after 30 and 40 years? And what I found is that like that, that first of all, the uh, the willingness to to play and the playfulness in, in the room that was cultivated by the artistic director, Liz LaPompe, um, was was definitely something that made it happen. But then also like bringing in, like having fresh perspectives of younger people come in with new ideas and new energy and new enthusiasm really helps move the thing, um, uh, helps make it relevant and, and, and healthy, kind of, I think. So yeah. and I think that's what we strive for, yeah. And I think there is uh, like, like bringing new generations and working with new generations. For me, there is something of like of your identity, guys, like of Blue Mouth. It just renewing and challenging again the definition of performing arts and theater, <laughs> because you're not staying with like the old fashioned like definitions. You're always like moving forward. <laughs> One of our collaborators the other day, Mariel, who's probably the youngest in the group, uh, she showed us her uh, episode that she's working on. And she felt really insecure. She's like, I don't think it's Blue Mouth. I, I, she's like, I don't, it's not like the rest of your episodes. And we're like, no, no, that's exactly why we love it. It's like, keep it the way it is. Cause it's more, it's very funny. It's completely different. I was like, if everything was poetic and reflective, I'm like it would be so boring. I'm like, come on, we need like a new ideas. And so, and everyone agreed with that. Everyone's like, no, 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 no. Like, and so, um, so yeah, so she got some in, um, uh, some encouragement and some uh, support to be like, no, 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 follow your ideas. It's what makes it really interesting. Mm-hmm. Even the podcast, like that was really Peter's idea for Cafe Sarajevo. I mean, mm-hmm. and so, um, and then Mariel as well, like sort of bringing in new people who have areas of um, uh, really specific um, uh, expertise uh, to help to, and to learn from them about, oh, okay, how do you create a podcast and how would that work? Uh, I was really, anyway, detailed but and even like learning and, and having like when with cafe sarajevo i was determined that that it, everyone had to have the experience on their personal phones uh, mm-hmm. and i i was fighting everyone for like a year and it was so many problems with that like different operating systems memory blah 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 and then in the end someone suggested or maybe for a year they were like what if we use radio frequency you know, there's no latency. There's no, yeah, the delays. It's so much easier. And I'm like, no, it's got to be their phones. <laughs> and then finally, I'm like, all right, 
Uh, and then we did it and it was way better. It was so much better. And I was like, oh, why was I, why was I dragging my heels for so long? <laughs> I think it's part of the creative process, just, you know, figuring things out. And like every single episode of Elephant, by the way, is very different, hmm. very different. But I think that's like your, the poetry of your work. <laughs> and it is poetic because it's very authentic, because it's coming from a very deep place for each artist i think um it's yeah. really interesting within your uh, the um you had some material you sent us uh, uh, the other day uh you were talking about arto and i was like oh um, arto i haven't really thought about that in a while so last night i'm like oh going back in my bookshelf and it's like trying to remember like because i was so into arto when, when i was i was still in but the impact of like looking at particularly with Arto, like the notion of the mise-en-scene about how it's not just the language, it's the gesture, it's the sound, it's the environment, it's all those things coming together. I'm like, right. And then, you know, Arto was highly influential with, with um, on uh, Peter, Brook. Peter Brook, Jerzy Grotowski. Like, oh, Grotowski is like, we talk about that all the time, sort of like the core theater and Bertolt Brecht. And there's this really clear, as far as I can see it, like what we're doing is just like, um, a development of, of a history of performance that is so specific and clear and we're just trying to continue that uh, the, those those ideals and those values and, and uh, uh, forward in a way that is that's engaging interesting and and hopefully fun for the audience you know yeah. it's also interesting like the the Arteau is french and in french the um the word for audience is spectateur so mm -hmm. they look, so they see the theater before they listen. Whereas in English, it's an audience, so they listen. It's kind of more text-based than, uh, and I think that there's something interesting like that. Like, I think that we, I think we like, I mean, we're coming from, from dance backgrounds as well, so that it's very visual. Um, and even earlier on, I think I, I always called what we did choreographing theater. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, uh, uh, this, yeah, yeah I was thinking too, like, because I, 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 and my French is really bad, so I apologize. I was an American, but the sort of like the idea of mise en scène, and I think we, I was kind of felt like we took it a step further because there was a time where we talked on, uh, was, say, right, like mise en jeu, like to put into play as opposed to put in the scene. Mm -hmm. And so this idea of like putting something, like there's something a little bit more active, you know, or there's this idea of like, or giving up and letting, like, let, putting something in playing, seeing where it goes and responding to it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and jeu, by the way, in French means game, like play. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think, and that's why I, the, in, in, in your introduction, in your presentation, Antonin Artaud is cited because I truly believe that your work, in your work, in every single of your creations, you are challenging the language, you are going beyond uh, the language beyond the appearances uh, and that you're doing because there's like so much like physicality and poetry in every gesture uh, of your creation. Uh, so I'm just going to to go to, to the last question. We'll just bring you with us when we, uh, wherever we go, we go on tour and you can just describe <laughs> our work, it'd be great. <laughs> I'll, be, I'll be happy to tour with you. <laughs> to be able to see your creations at the very beginning and then the spectator uh, <laughs> with the spectators. I would love that. <laughs> so the collective, um, the collective's artists, so Blue Mouth Inc's artists, all, were already at some distance from each other, living on both sides of the border. So we're New York, Toronto, Montreal. So how do you creatively keep in touch with each other? So you almost answered to that part, but, and with the world in general, and how has this changed because of the pandemic? How, like, were there any changes? Well, I think for sure. I mean, uh, part of the reason to, uh, the part of coming to New York, I guess maybe almost 15 years ago now, um, part of it was creative, you know, that, uh, uh, two of the core members are uh, have a, a American uh, and Canadian, and this idea of like we wanted to see whether the work we felt like we were um, uh, the work was resonating quite well in Toronto, and we had a, uh, an audience and and, um, and a community, and we wanted to see whether that would resonate in New York. Um, and we also came for personal reasons. My my mother at the time was uh, dealing with some health issues, uh, so it came to be with my family and. Um, 
and so it, and I, I, at that time, um, we just started using the internet because we were living in New York. Uh, majority of us were living in Toronto, uh, the, the company, and then Sabrina moved from New York to, to Montreal. So there was definitely three cities, and that was like 10 years ago. And so even then, we were exploring, you know, different like Google Chat or other types of ways to maintain creativity and to collaborate, you know, um, over the internet. And um, I mean, then it was kind of, you know, using uh, Zoom didn't exist. So we were using, uh, you know, like uh, our iPhones or trying to find or WhatsApp or trying to find free ways that we didn't run up a phone bill to sort of uh, collaborate regularly. Uh, and then also um, a, a Porter Air opened in Toronto, uh, the island, which made uh, affordable to fly between uh, Newark and Toronto Island. Um, so suddenly the the distance that you in, I think, even five years earlier would have been impossible to maintain a creative relationship. Suddenly we were able to, we met regularly on online, you know, and with, through WhatsApp and we we would chat and see each other, which is uh, make a difference in talking to each other. We, we would actually travel up to Toronto at least twice a year. Or more, yeah. Yeah, yeah. so so it would usually we would spend summers. We, we had some grants to, to develop like um, something about it. Or sorry, yeah, the the island show, the um, it comes in waves, um, and then we would spend another two weeks after to stay and develop the next show. So we were kind of um, trying to um, if the physical. I think I think with COVID, our online creation really developed and bloomed and more than bef ever before because I think we were really forced to not go up to Canada to, to work on a show. So we had to, we created um, assignments that we would show to each other um, every two weeks, like Montreal, Toronto, Brooklyn. And, um, and every, everyone kind of offered different things. So it was different uh, every week, like, or every, every time. And sometimes it was writing, sometimes it was videotaping, uh, dancing outside. Sometimes it was, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, podcast, like create your own podcast. Or uh, there was even like, I taught everyone how to, how to make, um, you know, a corn pie that my mom makes um, from <laughs> South America. Um, so there was all these different kind of creative, and we were talking about the ideas around originally the piece was um, uh, uh, inspired by Judy Chicago's um, The Dinner Party, which is uh, an installation at the um, Brooklyn Academy of Mu uh, Brooklyn mm -hmm. Museum, and it was a, a feminist piece from the 1970s that she put place settings um of all uh, historical women um some were mythical but a lot of them were actually historical women and so giving them a place at the table so originally we had thought to create a piece that was um more feminist and more uh, led by the women of blue mouth and we've always felt like we had a feminist aesthetic because our writing is more poetic and non and we're not hierarchical and um so uh but but uh it sort of kind of switched a little bit as as we developed uh the ideas and as we started to share and and yeah and one of the challenges and this came up in actually in a, a, with discussion after the last screening for the elephant was someone asked about the couples so this particular um uh, group that's working on uh, elephant uh, there are two couples in the group myself and lucy and there's also uh, tony chong and carol priya who live in montreal um, um, and so someone asked if that is a challenge, is that a problem? And, um, and uh, I think we m most immediately said no, but then uh, um, some realized that with the pandemic, um, some of the collaborators like um, Lisa and um, uh, Mariel live alone. And so when they were in isolation, it's a very different experience. And so when we would do creative assignments, you know, let's go out, we, um, you know, go out and pick a song or, or shoot some location and uh, Lucy and I could go together and we could help each other. And so, um, uh, and Tony and Carol were able to help each other, but Meryl was, or, and Lisa were- She was holding her iPhone up, you know, and, and trying to film like herself selfie, yeah. being like walking down the street casually and <laughs> yeah, it was- Yeah, so I think the isolation of the pandemic was very, was more challenging in many ways for them creatively because yeah. to have that, but also I think the collaboration through the regularly, you know, weekly meetings on Zoom, 
uh, we were able to keep in contact and uh, to um, to sort of inspire. I mean, Sabrina has a family; her husband's an artist, and uh, so I think he she had someone to. Sort and of... she and she lives very close to Carol and Tony, so mm. they can help each other um, mm -hmm. with um, mm -hmm. with video. Mm -hmm. uh, and both, yeah, Tony and Sabrina have a lot of video experience. But I think that I, I think the, the the way of engaging remotely um, was something that wasn't was not really new to us because mm -hmm. you know for the last ten years we've been. Lucy and I, in particular, have been working remotely with our collaborators in in Montreal, mm -hmm. and so uh, what was missing now was our our opportunity to go up there for the period of intense creation. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I feel like we've been able to adapt, but yeah, yeah. and it's in some ways the, the it you know sometimes our pieces can again take a time you know two to five years or three to five years, and this process has been a little bit quicker you know that it has developed a little bit more. I'd say over we've been working together for the last year and sort of evolved and then we kind of give ourselves deadlines to suddenly then to share material or else we just be in working together indefinitely. Yeah. Okay, guys, thank you so very much <laughs> for taking three the hours. <laughs> thank you. I'm just going to mention the fact that so uh I'm inviting the audience and the spectator <laughs> to go like those who don't know the, your work. Uh, your website is in the bio uh, and the elephant, so your new piece is in the bio and in the presentation as well. Thank you for the great questions as well. Like it's, yeah, yeah, and the, you get it. It's like, it feels so reassuring, you know, that, that uh, the way that you speak about the work is like, it's so, um, uh, it's like a, a gift to us, you know? Yeah. Well, thank you. Your your work has truly inspired a number of people I know around me. Uh, it has a profound poetry and questioning of our era, as it says in the presentation. And uh, yeah, that's why I keep going and keep creating. And yeah, we need more poetry, I think, <laughs> more <Right. laughs> in this uncertain life. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah.